Sorry for that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm Ashley, and this here is Ranger. And Ranger is a golden retriever. He's two, and he's toward the end of his training, um, but he is still very much a baby and um, in training. So he very likely will probably be a little antsy up here, but that's all right. Um, up front here, we have Rue. Rue's a nine-year-old golden retriever, and she is the love bug. Afterwards, we'll, we'll let everybody pet him if you want. Um, but yes, that's real. So when you think about service dogs, most people um, know mobility, guide dogs, psychiatric service dog, PTSD. But you know, there's also diabetic alert dogs. Um, with service dogs, they're highly trained in public access. They are task trained. So they are individually trained to mitigate a disability. And that's what makes these guys special. The DADs, what we train them to do, is to alert to highs and lows. Right? So each person's request might look a little different. Some people like the alerts to start at 80. Others like it at 70. I've had some people want it at 65. But each person's might be a little different. So usually we do 70 and below or 150 and above. Um, past the tests, they are also trained to potentially fetch medications, get juice boxes from the fridge, super cool, and get help, right? Get help, that's a big one. Sometimes, um, actually probably more often than not, these guys will, are dual trained. They're not just trained in diabetic alert. Um, a lot of times we see a lot of psychiatric, right? Especially um, PTSD starts coming through. Um, and so that dual, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that here, here later about that dual. So why? Why when we have all these other cool equipment? Why a diabetic alert dog? Well, it's pretty cool. These guys beat the CGMs by 20 minutes consistently, right? That right there is impressive. So not only do they beat the CGMs, but very often, I don't want to say very often, but it's pretty common, these guys are right when the meters are wrong, right? People go and manually check their blood sugar and it's fine. No, I'm fine. Hmm. Dog's like, no, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. And they just keep coming back. And I always tell people, man, when in doubt, check it out. Manually check your blood sugar. Okay. Go back in with a good old finger prick. I know a lot of people don't like to. Um, and check it because it, it is common for them to be off. Right? Um, so those two things are pretty cool. Independence, though. For a lot of people, especially children, college students, going off to college, first time living alone. Um, these dogs can have a profound impact <clears throat> on people's lives. These guys are here when no one else is. When they're in the trenches, right? when those blood sugars are stubborn and they will not come down and they feel like crap, <laughs> right? These guys are there. So the, the quality of life, especially for children and college students, I've seen a drastic improvement. So that emotional support is a big, um, they can also help increase the physical activity, not only because they have to be active. You have a dog. You better take that dog for walks, right? <laughs> or they're going to self-destruct because they are dogs. Right? They're not perfect. They're not machines. But they're pretty cool. That added level of security. Um, parents, Ruth here, she's actually one of, one of my clients and now a coworker. Um, and her daughter has type 1. 
And that is how we first met, is her daughter and her diabetic alert dog that, that we trained. So um, also tidbit, if you have any, like want to talk to somebody that's personally got a kid with a diabetic alert dog, she's here to talk with you guys afterwards as well. So what does an alert look like? Well, that can look different for each person. It really is a preference. Do they want a nose nudge, a boop? Do they want a paw, the dog paws? Um, I've, I've, it's personal preference. We can kind of do whatever you want. A lot of times the paw ends up being the go-to. It's hard to ignore that. And I'll show you here in a minute. I'm going to have him do an, an alert. And uh, you'll see, you can't ignore it. <laughs> um, so there are times, too, where these alerts look a lot different, okay? When we have what's called tripods, and tripods are when we have young children or somebody with a disability that can't necessarily handle the dog. And the dog is handled by someone else but it alerts to another person. So there's this kind of tripod. The dog has to let smell one person but go alert another. Okay, so young children in another room. Um, those are the situations where we, we kind of see those tripods and it does look different. We oftentimes will put a doorbell, a push doorbell, that rings in another room. So you can have the button in one room, it rings in another so that the parents can be alerted. So it, it's, there's different ways. Bringsels are these little stick things that they can come and hand you. That's another good one because you can't ignore it. They're in your face with a stick, little thing like, hey, you can't ignore me because a lot of times it's really easy to go, no, I'm fine. See it a lot. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. No, the dogs are right. They're right. Give you, here to go. Uh, oh, wave for a high and bow for a low. So typically, we like to teach them to wave for a high so they will alert and go, hi, you're high. And then they'll alert and they'll go, no, you're low. So it's, there's kind of two different things. So I still tell people, don't, don't rely on that. You still need to manually check your blood sugar, right? Don't rely on it. But it gives you an idea um, what's going on. These guys alert to swings, changes, big changes. So uh, someone might be in range and the dog's alerting. No, the dog's probably not wrong. Wait 20 minutes, check it. And oftentimes you'll see a drastic, huge, fast drop in those blood sugars. And you're going, oh. So they pick up on those huge swings. So even if they're in, in range and you're dropping super fast, they, they'll, they'll let you know. So I have a video here, and this is one of my clients. And he's doing a live alert here. She's got cameras because she passes out often. And she's actually not type one. She's, she's got something else that causes the blood sugars to go down. I didn't touch that. I hope that doesn't happen again. But anyways, um, so that was kind of that live alert of, hey, hi. The other alerts that look a little different, night alerts. Night alerts are hard. Night alerts are hard because you have to have a dog that's persistent. People don't like to wake up, especially if they're grumpy kids. You have a dog that goes jumping up and down on their chest if they have to go and wake up. They've slept through their alarms, they've slept through all of the things, and the dog's going, not today, wake up. Um, dog's sleep cycles are in 20 minute cycles, so sometimes you have to wait for them to come out of that deep sleep cycle to alert, so there can be a little bit more of a delay at night if they are deep, in deep sleep. Um, car alert, each car alert has looked different. The dog kind of picks the car alert because it's really unique, you're driving, Right? How is that dog going to get your attention? Some bark, some come up and, and paw. It, it, it just it depends. So after the alert, what? What then? So that's where that added support right? of, hey, do they need to get something for them? Do they need to fetch the medication, juice, find someone to help them? What is it? Um, if the person doesn't acknowledge the alert, these guys are trained to go get someone else. They'll go and start alerting someone else. All of a sudden, everybody in the room, there's been a party. Um, I was at a 
get together at a house and there was three type ones and one diabetic alert dog. I will tell you, he was a busy, busy boy that night because they will alert to other people. We don't necessarily like them to. Um, we try to teach them to just alert to their person, but in this um, particular aspect, he was fairly early on in his training and I wasn't about to ignore that, right? Because we don't want to discourage them. <laughs> and it was one of those things where he'd come up and he's like, walk in circles and he just walks up, paws me, bows and goes, I don't know. I'm like, excuse me, with all type ones, please get out your meter and check your blood sugars. And sure enough, right, it was, you hear, it's me. <laughs> uh, so again, the accuracy, what, they are extremely accurate when trained correctly and rewarded for the correct alerts. I mean down to 70 on the dot. It's cool. So there are times when that can decrease. And oftentimes it's if someone is, blood sugars have been stubborn, stubbornly high and that's become their new normal. So let's say that they can't, they're, they're sitting at, you know, 150, 170 forever and they, they can't get them down. Their dogs are not gonna alert to those 150s anymore because that's normal, right? So those are times when they can kind of come down. Again, they can alert to the other people. Um, breed choices, this is, a, this is a good question. Technically, does the dog have a nose? Yeah, now they can do it. However, that does not mean that they are a good choice. We, when dog, we're thinking about this, we want dogs with a long lifespans we need dogs that are amiable. They want to work for you. A livestock guardian dog that likes to sit out and guard sheep is not going to be a good choice. That dog's gonna give you the finger, right? <laughs> so, not a good choice. Oftentimes you see labs and goldens being used and there is a reason for that. They are amiable, they have even more even temperaments, you kinda know what you're getting, and they love people. So, selecting a service dog. People love when you go, Oh, he's a rescue and we turned him in. You will not see that very often. And I push to not do that. And the reason being is you have no idea the health history of that dog and that parent's dog. Again, lifespan. How long are these dogs going to live? These are a huge investment in time and money. And you want something that's going to last. The last thing you're going to want to do is spend that much money find out, oh, it's not gonna work, okay? Um, temperament testing early. Going in and, and picking that dog out of a litter that has the best chance at becoming a service dog. Now you can do everything correct. Find that best chance, have the best puppy, and they still might not make it. I mean, that's part of why if people go in and to an organization and get a service dog, why they're so expensive. Because how many dogs did it take to get that one? It might be a lot. Hi. Oh, he's got an itch. All right, um, so younger dogs, obviously. We like younger dogs. Um, you can start them out, good habits are made right away. But back to the rescue thing, I had, back when I worked with Alaska Assistance Dogs, they were trying to take rescue dogs, and especially from the shelter. Is, which is awesome. However, they put a year's worth of training into that dog. And they were out in the garden one day and somebody came up the driveway and they had a rake. And they said, how's it going? And the dog turned on them. Because the dog had clearly been abused at some point and all that went down the drain. Right? And so little things that we can do to help avoid situations like that, we want, we want to do. Um, when does it begin? Birth. Day one. When I have puppies, Rue here is my retired breeding bitch, and she has produced some lovely, lovely dogs. Now, when I say birth, we're getting them used to stress. Can these puppies handle stress? It looks like turning them up like this, turning them on their head, turning them on their side, playing with their feet slightly stressing their bodies so that they become, that becomes normal. They, they can handle that stress and come down from it. 
or as soon as possible. So a lot of times, obviously, people will get puppies at like eight weeks. We're gonna start then. Um, it might look a little different depending on the age. We don't wanna start too early when they don't have their shots and just be like, hey, let's go. We don't want them to get sick. So oftentimes we're carrying them through a store before they have all their shots. So if you see someone with a little puppy carrying them around the store, it's because we don't want them on the ground. We don't wanna risk them getting sick. Public access training is the key. Scent training's easy, right? Teaching them to alert to blood sugars is easy. The public access training is the hard part. They have to be taught, they have to be taught to behave in every situation. Leave it. Like this. They have to handle whatever comes at them and still be able to do a job. They can't be scared. They can't be overthinking. They, the amount of training that goes into public access is, is astronomical. So that is the most thing. We want these dogs to be unobtrusive, meaning you go to a restaurant, they're tucked under the table, you come out, everybody goes, the best thing you can do is, I had no idea there was a dog there. That's the best thing you can do. So how do they do it? Um, they smell the chemical changes. Now, University of Cambridge did a study, and they found that the dogs, they believe, are alerting to the isoprene. I think I pronounced that right. You guys are all doctors. Did I say it right? Okay. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. Um, but that's what they're kind of alerting for, for the lows. Um, when someone starts with the diabetes, we have them collect scent samples with cotton balls. And when they're between ranges of 70 to 80, we have a jar marked 60 to 70, 50 to 60. And when they're in that range, they take the cotton swabs, they put it in their mouth, they get it all slobbery, and they spit it into the jars. Put it on right into the freezer. Mm, that comes in handy when we start doing the training. And we like to start with lows. I start with the lowest sample they have, and that's the first one because we Lows are what's gonna kill someone. That's what they're gonna die from the soonest, right? So we need the lows to be the best out of any of them. So we start with the lows and then we go to the highs. It takes oftentimes two to three years to train these guys. Um, mainly the majority of that being public access and they have to mature. Their brains are babies. He might be too, but his brain is just now kind of like starting to flicker on where I'm like, you have a brain, you're there. Thank God. Because that teenage years, dogs go through them too. I'm sure those of you who have had puppies know that six months to a year and a half is uh, <clears throat> challenging. Um, so who qualifies medically? Type ones. Um, other people that have hypoglycemia unaware, right? So. Um, oftentimes, people with, I've seen Hashimoto's, right, where they, they, they have the blood sugar problems with that. Um, and we need people with good A1Cs, or at least kind of good. Because again, if they're super high or they're super low, that becomes the dog's normal, right? We need, it, we need to be able to have them kind of in a good range. And yes, the dogs will help tighten that range up, but we can't have it super off the charts. Type twos, generally we don't train for because it can be managed e easier with other ways. So we typically stick with the type ones. Things to consider, there is significantly more <laughs> blood sugar checks manually with a diabetic alert dog. So people have to check their blood sugars more. And, and for the people that don't like to check their blood sugars, that can be a challenge because if they're not checking and they're not rewarding the dog when it's right, then the dog's gonna stop alerting and next thing you know, you just have a nice pet, right? Um, you are no longer invisible. Had I walked into this room without a dog, you wouldn't have known. I walk into the room and everybody goes, oh. That doesn't change. That is everywhere someone goes with a service dog. You go to the store, you just wanna walk into the store really quick? Huh. Got news for you. It's not quick. Oh my God, you must be a trainer. Diabetics get this a lot. 
you must be a trainer. It must be really hard for you to let him go because it's not visible, right? The disability is not visible. So you, those people that are used to being invisible are no longer invisible, and that can be really hard for people that are super shy. Cost of care, training, you know, these guys are an investment, and for some people this can be you know, too much. So they're not machines. They do miss alerts sometimes. So I try to warn people, but it's not very, it's not very often. Um, and training is never complete. It's kind of like you guys with continuing education. These guys have to have continued education. Use it or lose it. Dogs are the same. So there's a couple different ways you can get to the dog, uh, DAD. You can owner train them, but there's pros and cons to that. You better have some experience with dogs and be able to navigate that because th there's a lot of tricks to the trade. There's a lot of tricks to the trade. So a lot of people that I deal with are doing the middle one here where they are called self-trainers. They have their dog, but they come to me. We meet up once a week. I give them homework. They go home. All right? And so they're getting guided through it, but they're doing the majority of the training themselves. And then there's the fully trained through programs. That's awesome because you're getting a dog that's made it through the program and guaranteed. But it's expensive. What are we talking here? Money. Mm -hmm. So generally, the average you see is between $8,000 and $25,000. The more tasks that you request past just alerting for or the alerts for the lows and the highs, that increases your price. So if these guys are a tripod team and you're having to add extra people into these alerts, because that's a lot more complicated, if you're having to get more juice boxes out of the fridge and we're having to teach them to open the fridge, get the juice, close the fridge, bring it back, right? Those are all things that are going to increase it. Um, and so it really depends on the route people take. If they're just doing it themselves, then it's going to be the cost of the puppy and then the training and the care. But again, as the more you do. Oh boy. Uh, common mis misconceptions, um, they don't have to have a certification. There is no certification, which is part of the problem with all the fake service dogs. That is a big problem these days, is, and you know it, walk into Walmart. Walk into Walmart and you're almost guaranteed to see Fido in the cart or barking, right? Those are obviously not legitimate service dogs. Service dogs are not supposed to be in carts. Um, they don't have to wear a vest, right? It's helpful, but they don't have to legally. And they're normal dogs. You take these vests off of them, and they go from work mode to absolute nutcases, and you'd never know. The difference between service dogs, emotional support, and therapy. There's a, there's a big difference. Is primarily being service dogs are individually trained. They work for one person, and they have public access rights, meaning they can go wherever the public can go. Emotional support animals, simply their existing helps the psychiatric should, the benefits of that, right? They, they help that aspect, so just being there. They're not specifically trained. Um, and then therapy dogs will beep. Everybody can pet it, right? Helps release oxytocin, all the feel-good hormones. They go into hospitals, schools. Are you bored? Hospitals, schools. And that type of thing. So when some, if you have a service animal come in, there's only two things you can ask. Is it a service animal? And what task has that dog been trained to do for you? Um, you may not ask for documentation, and you may not ask for them to demonstrate that task. Those are things you cannot do. Insurance does not cover service dogs right now, diabetic alert dogs, which is a bummer. Because if you look at how much, if you look at how much a hospital stay is, one hospital stay, that dog prevents one emergency room visit, it pays for itself, right? So it would be awesome to eventually get there, and I hope that we eventually do, but as of right now, it is not, but I still encourage everybody to work with their doctors, get a note, try and still go to the, the insurance company and try, because the more it's tried, the more it's getting on the radar, and 
it is picking up traction with the insurance companies where it's kind of starting to be talked about. So the more that you guys can kind of help that out, the better for, for your patients as well. Um, in there, I've got some links if you guys want to later um, go in there and, and learn about more service dogs. And I'm going to have a, have a scent sample. I should probably talk here. I have a scent sample here um, in my pocket because Ranger is fairly early in his um, learning. And typically, we have these little tents, and we put little holes in them in the top so that the scent can come out. And we teach them, these. we do metal because it doesn't have a scent. Plastic, they can alert to the plastics, all sorts of stuff. Um, so I'll come over here and I'll, I'll kind of show you what his is early learning look, looking like. He's very enthusiastic, as you can tell. Um, and so as they get better, we take away the tins. It's kind of gross, but I take and like wipe the saliva sample on the back of my hand, and then that yeah, it's a, um, and that's how they kind of alert um, later to it when we try to phase this out and make it more realistic. So um, if anybody has any questions, no, well. These guys will be up here. If you guys have any questions afterwards or want to come pet the dogs, we're up, up here. Oh. Well, I was just kind of hoping if you guys could just tell us some more cool stories, like from your absolutely. personal experience or from the people you've worked with. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually have a story someone sent me. I was hoping I'd have time to read it, and I will go ahead and read it for you guys here. Um, so. Charlie was, is the diabetic alert dog for my godmother. And when I first started, that's how I got in this. I lived with her for many years. I saw the struggles. Of course, my first diabetic alert dog I trained went to her, right? So she, she sent in, and I learned a lot from living with that and seeing that transition from trainer to handler to what it does, what they're running into, the problems they're running into at home. And you're going to hear probably some things in here that I talked about earlier. So Charlie alerted me consistently when we were taking a walk. Oh, she's walking? Yeah, that's that activity. I kept checking my CGM and it was in range. I started getting where I was getting lightheaded and eyes were like glitter. I finally took him seriously and pulled out my glaucometer out of my backpack and I was down to 37. It hit quickly and easily could have passed out. I was able to correct it with apple juice. Right. That right there, that's cool. I think it's cool. Hopefully you think it's cool too. But, you know, I'm kind of a dog nerd, so take it for what it is. Um, the other thing too is sleeping at night, right? It's easy to sleep through the alarms if they're sleeping hard enough or if they're too low and they can't wake up, that type thing. Um, and so she was talking in here about she wasn't feeling good she was really sick she had the flu she went and laid down and about two hours in the dog's jumping up and down on her chest right she's like i just i don't feel good please leave me alone right and he's like <laughs> not today charlie's very pushy it's kind of we like the pushy ones because they they don't take no for an answer you push them off they come back hey ruth can you push her away push her away keep pushing her Keep pushing her, keep pushing her. Do you see this? This dog does not get discouraged and we need that. You can do anything to this dog, anything. I mean, we've worked with autistic kids, right? Pulling on him, hitting him, she still comes back for more. We need those dogs to come back for more. Obviously, they, there's times where diabetics get grumpy. Go away, especially kids. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so that persistent of waking them up. Um, do you have any cool stories? I, well, I do, a little. Do you have the microphone? Yeah. Awesome. So we just can talk to you real quick. 
So as Ashley said, I'm the mom of a type 1 diabetic. My daughter got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, diabetes when she was 10. She didn't present normally. She had leg cramps. So we got the call from the doctor that night going, uh, please go to the hospital right now. Your daughter's got a blood sugar of 800. And I was like, um, no, she's fine. Like, my daughter's conscious. You have the wrong patient. And she handled me well, and she said, well, could you please go so we can check? And um, so we probably caught her a week before we would have been in full DKA, maybe. So we got lucky. But my daughter was already a pretty anxious child. She'd gone from being totally 100% healthy all the time to all of a sudden being in an ER situation where people are putting IVs in her and they're poking her with things. And she was almost like she couldn't even talk. She was so wrapped around herself and freaking out. We set a hospital record for the fastest ever people to get a CGM because she was so difficult with the finger sticks. So that being the case, when we got home, I had an extremely anxious child who was now like over the top worried. So for me, I am a dog person. I was like, what is the best distraction for a kid at this age and this condition? A puppy. <laughs> and I did everything Ashley said not to do. Um, we went to the rescue. <laughs> <laughs> we got a village dog. But he is the, the, he, we did do the one thing right. He is the perfect temperament for my daughter. And he is very patient and very understanding. So I also have the kiddo that will sleep through every single alarm. To this day, she is now 14. We're down the hallway going, could you shut that thing off and maybe get out of bed? So um, she cannot sleep through a mixed breed husky hitting her in the chest repeatedly. Um, so that part helped. but and she, she's covered for lows at night. Now, her dog did medical out. We ran into some spondylosis difficulties, so he is not a public access working dog. Um, he did for a while for her, and he got us through the worst of it, but now he just works at home, and he makes sure that she can get up at night. And he is the receptacle, though. He got her through multiple blood draws. He got her through multiple finger sticks. He's gotten her through all that puberty, emotional, turmoil like because now they're not just kids anymore they're different there's something wrong right and you have to get them to focus beyond themselves so she had that and they're great tear absorbers you guys and and great huggers so um, for us he was a godsend he took her out of oh poor me to okay we're team lewis we're in this together and somebody's got my back and i have to take care of him so for me, that was my cool story. And he's still a beloved part of the family. And he's her service dog. And she's his therapy human. And it all works out well together. Okay. I have a question here. Um, Judy, just so you know, I've got a question here at the chat. Oh, OK. So this is Dr. Lesher is uh, typing in from, um, she's online. We sometimes have kids who want to bring their diabetes alert dog to diabetes camp. We haven't figured out a way to make sure the dog is adequately cared for at camp in that it's not overworked around 64 kids with diabetes. So far, no one has ended up bringing their dog to camp, but do you have any suggestions for how to make that a good experience for the child and the dog in the future? So this is difficult, right? Because it really depends on the age of the child. Right? Can that child fully care for the dog by themselves? Because if the answer is no, then you, you can't expect the counselors to be able to take care of that many kids and take care of the dogs and everything else. So I think it's hard. And then you've got that many type ones running around, right? And so is it really okay alert wise to be able to, to, to have them there is that going to really affect the long-term um, accuracy if the dog's like oh my gosh it's everywhere but they're being ignored and and so I think it'd be kind of overwhelming it would be hard to to figure out how to do that 
honestly, if it were me, I'd kind of would would maybe set it up if you could where they could still visit with their dog once a day or something so that they're still having that interaction. They're still getting that time to decompress with their their best friend and all of that. I'd probably try to figure that out. The other thing too is I would look at having a camp dog. I got a therapy camp dog. If you haven't already, that's what I would be looking into because um, you might be able to kind of merge the two and kind of bridge that gap so there's not a huge change of my best friends here all the time, they still can kind of go and lean on, on something else. Hopefully that answered a kind of a question. Anybody else? Oh. More chat? All right, well, nobody else? Okay. So I have my own breeding program that I, I pull some of my dogs from. I, it's not all, obviously, I don't always have puppies. Um, I work with other service dog training organizations down in the States, and we all kind of have this working relationship where, hey, I've got a need for this, okay, yeah, I've got an upcoming litter, and so we can pull good quality, long, uh, lasting lines of good quality dogs and, and kind of shift them around. So um, usually out of state, sometimes you can find the occasional, but really if you're looking for service work, you want a line designated to service work because up here in Alaska, a lot of the dogs, labs or goldens, are from hunting lines. And you kind of have this hunting line aspect and then you have these family goldens aspect, right? And you don't want the crackhead hunting style because they are. They're absolutely bonkers. It's like having a border collie on the end of a leash but in a golden body and they just, you know, it's, it's too much for them. And it's too much for the average person to handle, right? Maybe if you could, you really want easy going but still able to do the job. Um, so typically we end up out of state for, for that. So. All right, thank you so much, Ashley. Yeah.